The cultural acceptance of the LGBTQ plus lifestyle has significantly changed these past few decades, especially through media and social media, where it is now almost accepted everywhere as being normal. On February 7th of 1991, the first kiss between a homosexual male couple airs on American network TV during an episode of LA Law. Advertisers threatened to quickly pull their ads over the scene. On January 18th of 1996, in one of the most popular TV sitcoms of all time, Friends, it features a lesbian wedding of two supporting characters, Carol and Susan. February 1997, Ellen DeGeneres appears on The Oprah Winfrey Show and comes out as a lesbian. She was applauded as being very brave. In the following decades until now, many actors, politicians, influencers, personalities, sports stars, and even Christians have come out and expressed their LGBTQ plus orientation. There's now an entire month known as Pride Month dedicated to the celebration and commemoration of lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender pride. The LGBTQ plus lifestyle has worked its way into our culture where it is now depicted as normal and acceptable. Those who do not accept this lifestyle as normal and okay are branded as bigots, narrow-minded, and unloving. There's a push in many countries to allow same-gender marriages, and if we oppose it, then we are branded as infringing upon the rights and happiness of those individuals. How are followers of Jesus Christ who believe in the Word of God to respond to the prevalence of the LGBTQ plus culture in our community? Close at our home, what if your child or close friend or relative comes to you and tells you they're struggling with same-sex attraction or they believe they're gay or lesbian? How are you to respond? This is not a topic we can avoid as followers of Jesus Christ. We must know how to engage in this debate and explain the biblical truths with love, grace, care, and compassion. Last week and this week, we are discussing the topics of gender identity and human sexuality. If you missed last week's message, I encourage you to listen to it online. It forms the basis for this message. Again, since I will share both the biblical and the non-biblical positions so that you can fully understand the issue at hand and engage the culture, if you don't listen carefully, you may wrongly assume I'm advocating for a non-biblical position. Now, I'll not be able to teach and to touch on all aspects of these issues as these issues are complex, but everything we discuss will be filtered through a biblical framework. Also, what I'm sharing is not my own personal conviction or opinions on this matter. It is God's teaching on this subject. And this morning, I want to discuss the issue of sexual orientation, specifically the LGBTQ plus debate. As we discussed last week, the current worldview uses a framework that not only separates our gender from biological sex, but divides a person into five parts as illustrated by the gender-bred person or the gender unicorn. These five are first, the sex assigned at birth or biological sex, followed by gender identity, and then gender expression. And then you have physical or sexual attraction and emotional attraction. Our focus this morning will be on the sexual attraction part, specifically one's sexual orientation. For the sake of our message, we will consider biological sex and gender identity as matching. We discussed this issue at length last week. That being said, it therefore narrows the issue to be discussed to being sexually attracted to the opposite sex, the same sex, or to both. I think it's important that we define some terms to make sure we're all on the same page. When I use homosexuality, the simple definition for this term is being attracted sexually to someone of the same gender or sex. Likewise, heterosexuality is being attracted sexually to someone of the opposite gender. Since normal sexual orientation is being attracted to someone of the opposite gender, what causes the orientation of homosexuality, the attraction to someone of the same gender? That's something we'll talk about more later, but it is a matter of vigorous debate today. Some say there is a genetic predisposition. 
It is the way I am. It is the way God has made me. Others say it is due to one's environment, such as family or cultural conditioning. Others say it comes out of a traumatic experience like abuse. Whatever the case for now, we just want to establish that there are two different sexual orientations, one same sex and the other opposite sex. The first thing we need to do is to distinguish between homosexuality, the orientation or attraction, or homosexual behavior, the action or lifestyle. Being homosexual is a state, an orientation, an inclination, a tendency, a proclivity. That means someone can have homosexual attraction but never express that attraction in action. Likewise, someone can be oriented heterosexually but experiment by engaging in homosexual acts. As we will see, what the Bible forbids and condemns is homosexual behavior, the acting out of same-sex attraction and desires, or living it out as a lifestyle. Please listen carefully. The Bible does not explicitly condemn the homosexual orientation, the state of being attracted to someone of the same gender, but it does condemn the acting out of homosexual attractions. And this is our first principle, number one. Distinguish between same-sex attraction and acting out on those same-sex sexual desires. Distinguish between same-sex attraction and acting out on those same-sex sexual desires. Why am I making this distinction? Because if we do not, we group everyone with same-sex attraction into one group, even those who desire to live in biblical holiness. And second, we make this distinction because it shows that what one feels doesn't necessarily have to be acted upon. Look what Romans chapter 8, verses 20 to 23 says. Romans chapter 8, verses 20 to 23. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. The Bible clearly states that this world and all of us are affected by sin and the fall of Adam and Eve. This includes even those who are spirit-filled Christians, as verse 23 clearly states. That means Christians and non-Christians alike are affected by sinful passions. But we look forward to the day when we are free from our sin nature and are glorified with our resurrected bodies. Until then, we are affected by sin and our sin nature. However, that does not mean we have to act out on our sins and sinful desires. It is not the same to have same-sex attraction and then to have it and live it out as the lifestyle that one chooses to live out. As John Piper puts it, it would be right to say that same-sex desires are sinful in the sense that they are disordered by sin and exist contrary to God's revealed will. But to be caused by sin and rooted in sin does not make a sinful desire equal to sinning. Sinning is what happens when rebellion against God expresses itself through our disorders. So it can be said that having same-sex attraction is not in itself an act of sinning unless acted upon. However, that being said, is it okay to have these attractions, and should we ask God to take away these same-sex attractions? It's like asking, is it okay to be sexually attracted to someone who's not my spouse? Should I ask God to take away those feelings? Or is it okay to desire and covet what is my neighbor's? Should I ask God to lessen that wrong desire? The answer to the first part is no. It is not okay to have those desires. But the answer to the second part is yes. We should ask God to take away those feelings and sinful desires. We should pray that the Lord will control our thought life so that we will not succumb to temptation and act out on what God has so clearly prohibited in the Bible, like adultery and stealing. 
It is similar to every other sin like lust, envy, cheating, hate, pride, anger, unforgiveness, and so on. It may be a lifelong struggle, but we pray that the victory we have in Jesus Christ will keep us from sinfully acting out on what we desire in our hearts. Attraction to the same sex is a byproduct of our sinful fallen world and not part of God's divine creation, design, and plan. Each of us are all sinners, and we have a propensity and predisposition to sin, which encompasses desires that are not part of God's divine creation plan. However, as new creations in Jesus Christ, we are to live spirit-filled lives and allow the controlling of our thoughts and actions to be according to God's Word. So it is with having same-sex attractions. It's not really okay to have same-sex attractions since it's not part of God's original creation design. But since we live in a sinful, fallen world, it is something many will struggle with as part of having a sin nature. But my friends, remember and listen carefully, God is loving, gracious, and merciful not to condemn us for our thought life struggles, but only holds us responsible for how we act on it. For example, we're not condemned for being angry, but how we act in anger and our actions in anger is another issue in our responsibility. Now, just so that it is clear in our minds, let's see what God's perspective on homosexual behavior is, meaning what He thinks about those who act out on their same-sex attraction. God's perspective on homosexual behavior is very clear. He abhors it and calls it a sin. It is both addressed in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. Turn me in your Bibles to Leviticus chapter 18, verse 22, and then to Leviticus chapter 20, verse 13. Leviticus chapter 18, verse 22, and Leviticus chapter 20, verse 13, for how God expected His people to live in righteousness as they came out of Egypt. I read now Leviticus chapter 18, verse 22. You shall not lie with a man as with a woman. It is an abomination. And then Leviticus chapter 20, verse 13. If a man lies with a male as he lies with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. Now, these are really strong words, but it gives us a clear view of how God views the homosexual behavior. But some may say, but that's in the Old Testament. That's part of the Mosaic law that no longer applies to us, or perhaps that was only applicable to that time and culture. But now we live in the New Testament times. We live in the age of grace. God's perspective may have changed. Well, let's look at some New Testament passages. Romans chapter 1, verses 26 to 27. Romans chapter 1, verses 26 to 27. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions. For even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another, men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error which was due. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 to 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 to 10. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And then we have 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 9 to 10. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 9 to 10. Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous person, but for the lawless and insubordinate for the ungodly and for sinners, for the unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for fornicators, for sodomites, for kidnappers, for liars, for perjurers, and if there is any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. God's Word in the New Testament is very clear. It is a sin in God's eyes to act out on same-sex sexual attraction. And this is our second biblical principle, number two. It is sin in God's eyes to act out on same-sex sexual attraction. It is sin in God's eyes to act out on same-sex sexual attractions. 
Homosexual behavior is a sin and an abomination to God, period. It is not up for debate. It is not up for justification. But I do want to point out also that we often have a tendency to pick out homosexual behavior from these verses and treat it as the worst of all sins. My friends, if we look carefully at these verses, homosexual behavior is part of a list along with fornicators, adulterers, liars, people who covet, those who steal, and those who get drunk. You see, God sees all of these sinful behaviors as sin on the same sin level as homosexual behavior. And therefore, we should not do all of these things if we want to honor God. Romans chapter 6, verse 23 reminds us that all sins lead to death. While we should not single out homosexual behavior as a terrible sin, it is not the worst sin a person can commit. We should also know what the Lord's feelings regarding this sin is. He is repulsed by it and hates it. Let us not diminish in severity what God calls sin simply because the prevalent culture has accepted it. Homosexual behavior, adultery, lying, murderers, lawlessness, those who covet and curse, and so on, has and always will be sin in the eyes of God. Now, if it's a sin to act out on same-sex sexual attraction, then naturally the question will be asked, why would God then make me like this? Because it would be very unfair that God would make me have these feelings and attraction and then forbid me from acting out on my sexual desires. Well, we have already stated that the fall affected God's perfect original creation design. To be fair, we have to examine how sexual orientation is acquired. Is it genetically acquired or environmentally conditioned or both? Another way to put it is this. Is sexual attraction because of nature or nurture? You see, if we are genetically predisposed to same-sex attraction, then an argument can be made that God is unfair. Simply put, if there is a gay gene that genetically predisposes someone to same-sex attraction, then that's kind of unfair. The idea that there is a gay gene and genetically acquired was first popularized when a popular research journal published in July of 1993 a study by Dr. Dean Hammer, which claims that there might be a gene for homosexuality. If that is true, then it is something one cannot change from because this is intrinsically who they are. This is why many in science have been trying to prove that there is, indeed, a gay gene. However, if you read the peer-reviewed articles assessing the research of Dr. Dean Hammer's I have, Many scientists would say his research was flawed from the beginning. I will leave the in-depth analysis to people who are much smarter than me. But one of the main flaws, as one scientist writes, is that genetic research can only focus on traits that are directly inherited and not heritable. Inherited traits are things like height, eye color, with little or no way to change the trait by a change in environment. But heritable traits can be affected by the environment, and most all of human characteristics are heritable. Hammer's research focused on the possible heritable predisposition to homosexuality, which is not inherited, so it is a flawed presupposition to begin with. There are simply too many variables at play and not enough controls, if you understand scientific research. It's like doing research to see if there's a gene that makes someone love the game of basketball. Of course, the environment that you're in and the family you grew up with has a huge impact on whether you like basketball or not. But you can just imagine the media firestorm that was created when Hammer's article was published, leading many to believe that there is a gay gene. However, science today has yet to conclusively prove this hypothesis in over 30 years of research. In fact, in 2019, the largest scientific study to ever be done with almost half a million people was published on the biological basis of sexual behavior and has confirmed that there is no single gay gene. Reuters wrote, the research, which analyzed data on DNA and sexual experiences from almost half a million people, found there are thousands of genetic variants linked to same-sex sexual behavior, most with very little effect. Five of the genetic markers were significantly associated with the same-sex behavior, the research said, but 
Even these are far from being predictive of a person's sexual preference. This means that non-genetic factors such as environment, upbringing, personality, nurture are far more significant in influencing a person's choice of sexual partner. Just as with most other personality, behavioral, and physical human traits, the researcher said. The results published in the journal Science found no clear patterns among genetic variants that could be used to meaningfully predict or identify a person's sexual behavior. Melinda Mills, an Oxford University sociologist, wrote a commentary to accompany this paper. In an interview, she said the study is further evidence that previous reports of a gay gene on the X chromosome are wrong. And because the researchers didn't find gene variants that correlated with the gradient of sexual behavior, she says, it undercuts Alfred Kinsley's decades-old scale, who tracked people in a spectrum of sexuality from exclusively heterosexual to exclusively homosexual. As one liberal news organization had to finally concede and admit, the study of nearly half a million people closes the door on the debate around the existence of a so-called gay gene. In fact, the Human Genome Project started in 1990 and completed in 2003, which determined all the base pairs that make up human DNA and identified, mapped, and sequenced all the genes of the human genome from both a physical and functional standpoint did not find a gay gene. Personally, from all that I've read and researched, looking at the scientific facts, it would be a big stretch for someone to say, God made me this way, with same-sex attraction, and therefore, I cannot change. And hypothetically, even if there was a genetic predisposition to something, it doesn't mean you have the moral right to act it out. As William Lane Craig notes, some researchers suspect there may be a gene which predisposes some people to alcoholism. Does that mean it's all right for someone with such predispositions to go ahead and drink to their heart's content and become an alcoholic? Obviously not. So if it's not genetically acquired, then it must be environmentally conditioned. The possible environmental factors that could contribute to same-sex attraction are so many, we can't talk about it in great detail this morning. But the basics would include, first, family, friendships, or relational dynamics. Research has shown homosexual orientation can come from cases of physical and emotional abuse. Abandonment. Sometimes it is from a lack of an engaged father figure or for a young boy with a very dominant mother figure. With his permission, I can share that there is in our church a happily married man with many children who in college was involved in homosexual relationships because he had issues of insecurities about his looks. He had very few friends, and the only ones who really cared for him and showed kindness to him were those who were practicing homosexuals. And because he fit in with the group so well, he confusingly thought he had same-sex attraction, only to realize after a few years that he didn't really have those attractions and had past trauma that was undealt with. Other environmental issues would be cultural stereotypes, such as what men and women like or are supposed to like and do. Boys are to love cars and machinery, and girls are to like all things dolls and the color pink. And if you don't fit neatly into these categories, then the assumption is you must be homosexual. Men love sports and women supposedly love cooking, so men who don't love sports must be gay. That is not true. A generation ago, traditionally and culturally, women were the ones who enjoyed cooking and baking and not men. And yet today, some of the best chefs and pastry chefs in the world are men. They must be gay, right? Of course not. Supposedly only women are to like fashion or into fashion, but there are some heterosexual men who love to wear nice and fashionable clothes just as much as women, and they are not gay. Cultural stereotypes of what are masculine and feminine may confuse someone who's struggling with their sexuality. Labeling is also a condition which sometimes affects homosexual orientation. I often hear teens referring to other teens derogatorily as gay or tomboy or lesbian because they don't fit into a cultural stereotype. But unfortunately, those labels stick with them. So when that person grows up, they believe they are that orientation, often after a failed first attempt at a relationship with the opposite gender 
or they don't feel happy in an emotionally unhealthy or toxic relationship. So they go back to that childhood label and think they must be homosexually inclined because they can't be in a satisfying opposite-sex relationship. There are other environmental conditions and factors that psychologically affect attraction and sexual drive. And this is our third principle, number three. Same-sex attraction is due primarily to environmental conditions, not genetics. Same-sex attraction is due primarily to environmental conditions, not genetics. And if same-sex attraction is primarily environmentally conditioned, then counseling or biblical counseling can help a person work through their emotions, past abuse and trauma, or family of origin issues. The truth is that for Christians and non-Christians alike, we don't completely and fully understand the complex and unique roles that genetics and the environment plays in producing same-sex attraction in a person. However, the important thing is not necessarily how one acquired same-sex attraction. The important thing is what you do with it. Remember, it is sin in God's eyes to act out on same-sex attraction, not necessarily to simply have the attraction. But what about my happiness is the question being proposed today by those in the LGBTQ plus community. Don't I have a right to be happy? If I feel this way and have this attraction, shouldn't I have the right to express my feelings and be happy? For example, the current culture says that since heterosexuals are allowed to be married, then homosexuals should have that right as well. If sex is intended only for marriage according to the Bible, then let homosexuals marry so they would not be committing adultery if they acted out on their attractions, some in the LGBTQ plus community advocate for. But my friends, as we've discussed, God's design for the institution of marriage is between one man and one woman in a monogamous relationship. And this original design for marriage goes as far back as Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, when marriage was ordained and defined by God. As we mentioned last week, Simple biology for procreation requires one man and one woman and no other combinations. As God so intended it, the beauty of sexual intimacy is only to be expressed in the bonds of marriage between one man and one woman. Therefore, anything apart from this divine setup is not fit for the institution of marriage. All others, whether between two men, two women, between one man and one woman, outside of marriage or before marriage, is strictly prohibited in the Bible in the institution of sacred marriage. But the argument says that puts homosexuals in a disadvantage because I have a right to be happy. Listen carefully, my friends. Happiness is not a right. Happiness and true joy is living out what God has ordained, which is that we live in holiness. You see, our fourth principle is this. You don't have a right to be happy. You have a right to be holy. You don't have a right to be happy. You have a right to be holy. Because if happiness is a right, I don't want to work. I may want to rob this church and steal all of its money so that I can be rich to make me happy. Perhaps three or four mistresses to fulfill all of my sexual fantasies would be great. And I want to live on the beach somewhere. That would make me really happy. Would you allow this lifestyle for me? And if you were to contradict what I so want, how dare you, how dare you infringe upon my happiness? Don't I have a right to be happy? If I come from a poor upbringing, then I can cheat and lie my way through life because that makes me happy. And I'm justified to steal so that I can be happy and feel happy. Would you agree? Is there justification for breaking the law so that you can be happy? This is the same logical argument as a homosexual saying they have a right to be happy. But the argument doesn't make sense and falls apart. Happiness is not a right. If it were the case, then everyone would do anything they wanted. Of course, we would even have to admit that our so-called right to happiness has limitations. There are rules that God and the laws of society have set, and we are bound by these rules for everyone's benefits. While you may argue that how a homosexual person expresses love to someone of the same gender doesn't affect anyone. Most importantly, it affects God. 
and he is grieved. Just like how a heterosexual person committing adultery or premarital fornication affects God. He sees it. He is grieved. So what are those who currently live out their same-sex attraction in a homosexual relationship supposed to do? Well, like with all sin, first, acknowledge your sin. Then, second, ask forgiveness for your sins. Because through the blood of Jesus Christ, God says, you can start over again. Third, believe that God has indeed forgiven you and quit feeling guilty. Fourth, believe that God has a plan for your life and for your well-being, and you can live life fully in holiness. Listen, the solution to homosexuality is not heterosexuality. The solution, the quote-unquote solution to homosexuality is not heterosexuality. It doesn't mean that when you become a Christian that you will start liking the opposite sex. Now, it can happen through the transformative work of the Holy Spirit. But for many others, they will continue to struggle with those same-sex attraction for a lifetime, just like all of us with other sins because of our sin nature. Redemption for homosexuals is not to get married and have kids. It is to live in holiness. It is to embrace your new identity in Christ as his child. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3 and verse 7 reminds us of this. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3 and 7 reminds us this. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, your holiness, that you should abstain from sexual immorality. Verse 7. For God did not call us to uncleanliness, but in holiness. My friends, for those who struggle with same-sex attraction, remember, our loving God helps us with all of our struggles through the power of the Holy Spirit by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Ask the Lord to help you with self-control, just like a heterosexual male attracted to a woman is to remain faithful to only his wife in marriage until death. Or if you're not yet married, to remain pure and celibate. So also, someone with same-sex attraction is to remain pure and holy, celibate with the help of the Lord. What God is asking the one who struggles with same-sex attraction is the same thing God asks of all single people, keeping pure both in the body but especially in the mind. You are to remain celibate in holiness. The attraction may or will come, but God can give you the grace not to act out on it. Is it hard? Absolutely. As we all struggle with sins. No one said it would be easy, as anyone who struggles with sexual sins understands. But our Lord died for us so that we can have victory over our sin and shame. We have the power of the one who overcame death to help us. Some may even need to seek professional Christian counseling to help them in this journey. I often get asked this question, will homosexuals go to heaven? Let me rephrase the question. Are there Christians who struggle with same-sex attraction, and will they go to heaven? My friends, all those who have placed their trust in Jesus Christ alone as their personal Savior will go to heaven. They are called Christians. The Bible is clear on this matter, regardless of labels. There are no such thing as unforgivable sins. If there were, then it calls into question the sufficiency of the blood of Christ to save. Is it possible for a Christian to struggle with homosexual orientation and temptations? Yes. Just like there are Christians who struggle with sexual temptation of a heterosexual type or struggle with coveting or stealing or lying. No Christian is without sin, as we're all sinners. But if one perpetually, as Galatians chapter 5 tells us, continues to sin and never repents, then there is a possibility that that person was never saved in the first place. But only the Lord truly knows the heart of someone. Followers of Christ should not promote or accept the LGBTQ plus lifestyle. Because if one is a Christian who truly follows Christ, they will accept and follow the truths of God's unchanging word. A follower of Christ will want to live the life God intended in holiness, even if it means living in holy celibacy. If there are Christians who actively live out 
the LGBTQ plus lifestyle and are unrepentant, nor see anything wrong with what God sees as an abomination, then that person may be living in open rebellion against God, unaware of biblical truths, or have basic faith issues which they need to settle with God first and foremost. Remember what we talked about last week. God desires all people to find their primary identity in Christ. God desires all people to find their primary identity in Christ. Regardless of our struggles, because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross, we are now children of the Almighty God. And therefore, our identity is completely changed. We are no longer sinners in the eyes of God, but we are God's friends, God's children. We are redeemed by Him. Our sexuality does not define us. Sexuality is a good gift from God, but not our defining distinctive. And praise be to God that our primary identifier and our full satisfaction is found in Jesus Christ. And it is in Him that we find our significance and our identity as children of the Almighty God, who have been called to live life uniquely and differently from the world as people who have been redeemed from the world. Finally, how do we as Christians interact with those who live out their same-sex sexual attractions? Well, just like with any other sinful people, we engage them because we want to win them to Jesus Christ as well. As a church, we should welcome them into our community. We should love them as God loves them, and He loves them deeply. My friends, if you're genuinely struggling with same-sex attraction, then God understands and He loves you. And if there are people who are struggling with this attraction, pray for them. Help them as you would a married person who struggles with same-sex attraction to someone they are not married to or one who struggles with maintaining purity in singleness. Show them grace and mercy. Many homosexuals that I've talked to do not want this orientation. They want to be like everyone else. They would like to have a different orientation if they could. And like with all who struggle with sin, we are to come alongside them and support them, providing them spiritual accountability and biblical boundaries. We can love those who live out homosexual lifestyles, but we as Christians, we don't have to accept or tolerate their sinful behavior. You see, there are two lies and myths that our contemporary culture has embraced. The first lie is that if you disagree with the way someone lives, then you must hate them and fear them. Mere differences of opinions means you are a hater, you are intolerant, you are narrow-minded, you are a bigot. That is not true. We often disagree with our parents, we disagree with our children, but we don't hate them, we don't fear them. In fact, we love them very much. The second lie is the notion that if you love someone, you just accept them and you must agree with whatever they believe or do. But my friends, you can love someone and disagree with the way that they live. For example, you love your children, but you must lovingly discipline them when they are wrong. Both these lies are what our 21st century culture has told us to accept as truth. So no wonder very few of us are willing to speak up for what is right according to the Bible, lest we be branded as a hater or narrow-minded or risk not being liked at all. My friends, we can be welcoming, but we don't have to be affirming. We can love and welcome sinners, but we don't have to affirm and embrace their sinful lifestyle. As they say, love the sinner, hate the sin. But you really do need to hate and not tolerate their sin. The Bible gives clear guidance for how we are to deal with sin and sinners. I know many homosexuals whom I would call a friend. They know I deeply care for them, but they also know that I hold to a biblical position, and I do not approve of their lifestyle. I do not condone their actions. If they want to continue to be my friend, that's great. But if they don't want to be my friend because of my biblical position, then there's nothing I can do about it. Just like if I'm friends with an adulterous man, I accept you as a friend. But I will tell you that straying from your marriage is wrong, and I do not accept you having a mistress, whatever the justification. We show sinners grace 
care and compassion, but we must also share with them the truth in love at the right time. Just because we love them doesn't mean we have to accept their behavior. As a great friend of sinners, Jesus provides a wonderful example. Turn with me in your Bibles to John chapter 8, verses 7 to 12. John chapter 8, verses 7 to 12. You know this story well. The Pharisees brought an adulterous woman to Jesus and asked him what he would do since Moses had commanded that such a person should be stoned. Look what Jesus does. So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Then those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest even to the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. Jesus asked those without sin to throw the first stone. Now, I don't know what Jesus wrote on the ground in verse 8. But I wonder if he was listing out the hidden sins of each of the accusers and they were convicted of heart and wisely the older ones left first. Verses 10 to 12. Then Jesus had raised himself up and so no one but the woman and said to her, Woman, who are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Everyone knew that this woman was guilty. Jesus knew the guilt of this adulterous woman, but does not define her by her sins. He does not call her, hey, adulterous woman, come and talk to me. He says, I don't condemn you, but go and sin no more a warning not to return to our sinful lifestyle. We see from Jesus' own words both grace and mercy, but with a demand for righteous living. This is the balance we are to employ in our response to those with same-sex attraction and to all other sinners, to show grace and love balance with a demand for holy living. And this is our fifth principle. As Jesus exemplified, show love and grace, but also expect righteous living. As Jesus exemplified, show love and grace, but also expect righteous living. This woman was more than just an adulterer. She was someone special, a child of God, and the charge for her was to no longer live in sin. In this same way, Jesus does not define a homosexual as a homosexual. Jesus sees them as people who struggle with sin, and they are to go and sin no more. Verse 12 says, those who follow Jesus will not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. They will be able to enjoy wonderful life in holiness. If this is how Jesus sees sinners, isn't that how we should see them as well? To show them grace and mercy while demanding holiness for ourselves and for them. Because remember, if we expect righteous living from someone, we better not be hypocrites and live holy lives as well. As Jay MacArthur says, how you live your life makes the gospel believable and unbelievable. The world doesn't judge you by your theology. It judges you by your behavior. That's why the way to reach the lost has little to do with methodology and everything to do with holy living. This, my friends, is our response to the sinful world as exemplified by Jesus. Grace and mercy undergirded with the demand for righteous living. This is how we are to treat all sinners and deal with all types of sin. As I noted last week, we may think that this is an issue we don't need to deal with. No one in my family will ever have same-sex attraction, or as long as my kids grow up in the church, they will be fine. As long as they attend a Christian school, they'll be okay. My friends, you would not then be living in reality. This is an issue that has worked its way into the churches today. This is an issue for the worldwide church. The church has to lovingly address these complex issues while never compromising the truth of the Bible. So remember these principles in the sexual orientation LGBTQ plus debate. Number one, distinguish between same-sex attraction and acting out on those same-sex sexual desires. Number two, remember, 
It is a sin in God's eyes to act out on same-sex sexual attraction. Number three, same-sex attraction is due primarily to environmental conditions, not genetics. Number four, you don't have a right to be happy. You have a right to be holy. And finally, as Jesus exemplified, show love and grace, but also expect righteous living. As a church, we need to reach out to the LGBTQ plus community with love and care. And it begins when we take the time to understand these complex issues and also know and embrace unshamedly God's view of sexuality and gender. May God give us the wisdom and the love and compassion to go forth and engage the world.